Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. This is part one of a two-part series looking at genetics and COVID-19. I'm joined today by Dr. Wendy Chung, Kennedy Family Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine and Chief of Clinical Genetics at Columbia University in New York. Dr. Robert Green, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a physician scientist who directs the Genomes to People or G2P research program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Broad Institute in Boston. And Dr. Mira Irons, AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. One of the ongoing mysteries about COVID-19 has been why some experience deadly infections while others escape with mild or no symptoms. You know, what role do genetics play and what do we know so far? Dr. Chung, why don't you start? Sure. There's a lot that we don't know, but we have a lot of hypotheses based on some of the clinical data so far. And I'll say that the genetic data are coming in and are going to give us a lot more answers very soon. We do know that there are differences by some genetic things like sex, for instance. Men do worse than women do in general with this. We know there are differences by race, ethnicity. Uh, how much of this is genetically determined versus social determinants of health, I think is one of the things we don't yet know and is a really important question coming up. We also know that there are pre-existing health conditions which predispose to worse outcomes, and those include many, many different things, but things like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, pre-existing heart disease. Um, in some of those cases, there may be genetic determinants or at least genetic risk factors that go with those factors. Um, and then there are some emerging data which are exciting uh, that are based on genome-wide association studies or looking for uh, more common variants. So one of the things that was early recognized was, for instance, blood type. Um, type A seems to be increased susceptibility. Type O seems to be protective. And additionally, there's a, a locus, we're not sure of exactly the gene, but a locus that's around CCR9 um, that may be increasing risk. And there are some hints of others as well. Dr. Green? Well, that was a fantastic summary. Uh, and, and I don't have a lot to add except to sort of sound a few cautionary notes. One is, uh, I think what we're seeing far and away is that social determinants of health are extremely important in terms of who gets infected, how it is spread, and the severity with which this impacts people. And we don't want to use genetics, and, and I, I think Wendy meant this as well, we don't want to ever use genetics as an excuse to explain away some of these social determinants of health, which are so important in the disparities that people in our society are experiencing. Having said that, I think it's really interesting to look at perhaps, for example, the healthy individuals and see that some healthy individuals are getting uh, mild or completely asymptomatic cases, and some healthy individuals are getting some devastating cases. And, uh, you know, there are there are clues. Uh, Wendy mentioned the uh, blood group clues. She mentioned the GWAS study that's recently come out. Um, there's also clues, for example, in the ACE2 receptor. This is the receptor that the spikes on the uh, virus itself actually connect to to invade your cells. And there are genetic variants um, in the code and in the protein of the ACE2 receptor. And we already know that some of them are have a little greater affinity for the virus than others that do not. So the hope is that clues like this are probably not going to be so important for predicting anything about who's vulnerable or who's not, but rather give us insights into the pathophysiology that will accelerate the hunt for treatments and vaccines. Well, apparently I was one of 100 physicians, or excuse me, 100 patients that called uh, as physician about that information about blood type to find out which one I was. Um, Dr. Irons, let's talk about prior infectious diseases. You know, what have we learned from how, the role that genetics play? Uh, what can we learn from uh, the past uh, in terms of research? So, you know, anytime we're faced with a new virus or a new condition, it's really important to to understand the natural history of this disorder. And as you've heard from Wendy and Robert, this, this virus acts like no other. Um, there are so many questions we have about its natural history, and it seems as though every day we hear of a new subgroup or a new uh, subpopulation of people. Um, and 
genetics, in genetics, it's always good to, um, it always helps to study the outliers. And so one example of something that came in the past was in the early days of HIV. Um, we started to recognize that there were a group of people who were resistant to HIV, even with repeated exposures. And so the ability to study those people led to the CCR5 gene, um, which actually codes for a, a cell receptor that allows that virus to enter the cell and found that there was a mutation within that gene, most common in northern people from northern European population. But basically, the, if you had two copies of the abnormal gene, it, um, it, it coded for a non-functional receptor. So the virus couldn't enter the cell. Um, if you had one copy, about 50% of your receptors were abnormal. But that information not only allowed us to, to um, understand how the disease affects those patients, um, but also told us something about how the disease operates, what the pathophysiology is of the disease, and that drug tar targets could then be um, developed for them. How about H1N1? Uh, do we see anything similar? So I don't, you know, there was there was some indication, there were some associations with H1N1, but you know, the other thing that's really important is to understand the difference between associations, you know, things that come up. And very many have come up with COVID-19. You know, what's the effect, you know, what's the role of vitamin D? What's the role of zinc? What's the role of other things? But you know, associations aren't always aren't always causative. So it's it's important to understand something that may just be associated or something that actually is important in the pathophysiology of the condition. Dr. Green, Dr. Chung, you're both working on your own research related to COVID-19. Can you tell us what you're working on and how it's going so far? Dr. Green? Um, I'm not a virologist or a, a molecular geneticist, uh, so um, my role is modest in this, but I've had the privilege of helping to coordinate at our institution the biobank response to trying to get some of these individuals who are infected into the biobank. We already have quite a large number of people in the biobank who are either genotyped or sequenced, and we're contributing cases to the international COVID-19 host vulnerability initiative, which is being coordinated out of the uh, University of Helsinki and the Broad Institute by other folks besides me. But it's it's wonderful to be a part of that. You know, one of the things I, I think we've all seen and recognized is that science has accelerated in its breadth and in its coordination and in its sharing in this time period, like in no other time period in my entire life. And with this small project, this International COVID-19 Host Vulnerability Initiative, um, we've been contributing, but so have hundreds of other centers to the idea that we can move fastest when we share our data and put it together. So um, I can't speak as a leader of that, but as a participant in that, it's been absolutely thrilling. And our first uh, GWAS studies are really coming out. We were even mentioned in the recent New England Journal of Medicine uh, GWAS article that uh, we were mentioned because even our small number of early data uh, actually um, reinforced some of their findings. Dr. Chung? So um, I am not a virologist either. Um, I'm a geneticist and oftentimes study much rarer diseases. Um, but what we did immediately was try and pivot both to understand how the infection was affecting our specific communities and try and gather as much as we could to be able to understand how to support those communities and understand if they were at particular risk, um, as well as in a similar way that I'll explain in a second to what Robert's been doing up in Boston. So one of the first things that we did is I think we had some preconceived notions that, uh, as I said, this was going to affect the lungs, it was going to affect the heart, that we might have 
patients that have diseases I study, like congenital heart disease or pulmonary hypertension, that would be at very, very high risk. And so, in a good way, we already had, um, in some cases, national or even international groups of individuals identified, and we had communication channels pre-existing. So we had online communities where we could very quickly send out surveys and understand the impact for them and uh, if they were getting sick and hospitalized. And in fact, um, quite, we're quite surprised that some of the people we would, thought would have been sickest, in fact, were not. Um, and was very, very helpful in terms of, again, getting the work out, word out through the network that we had, for instance, our pulmonary hypertension network, getting that information out to the treating physicians um, at those centers of excellence. Um, we also have had, uh, as another example, we do a lot of studies in autism, and again, could send out, in this case, um, survey-based uh, instruments, but to over 100,000 individuals and to be able to understand under quarantine conditions when children weren't getting services, a lot of what they needed in terms of ABA therapy or speech therapy or special education, what impact that was having for themselves and also for their parents and their families in terms of mental health and the burden and the strain. And so we've been using that information to pivot and think about how can we do COVID safe as things are opening up and what are the priority areas in terms of where those kiddos need the most support and where their families can use support either with distance-based or in-person therapies as they're coming online. So those were a couple ways that we did this. In New York, we had unfortunately a lot of infections, as people know. And the way that our healthcare system worked, our network of hospitals, is that my hospital became um, the single hospital for children. So we took in throughout our entire network all of the children, and that ended up giving us an enormous amount of experience very, very quickly with children. And in particular, with this disease that started emerging, not in the peak in March or early April, but just a little bit later because it was associated with um, after the acute infection. And so this has been called MIS-C or Kawasaki, Kawasaki. Um, it's gone by several different names, but it's this multi-systemic inflammatory condition. Um, and so with that, we've been trying to understand both the genetics of who gets that. Is there any predisposition? Um, right now, there's no immediate headline for that. So it's not clear that there's one single strong genetic factor in that, although I think we still need to keep working to understand this. And we also importantly started to understand very quickly how to treat it. And so uh, we actually came up with a protocol that's also been used for other conditions like this with IVIG and steroids, which has proven to be incredibly effective. And so the good news that came out out of this was net nationwide, internationally, we could put out what's been called the Columbia Protocol in terms of treating the kiddos with MIS-C. Uh, and thankfully, even though there were initially three deaths, uh, we haven't had any deaths at our hospital, and now there really is a protocol to keep kids safe. So um, again, you know, not, not necessarily something that I do in my day job usually, but you know, we've, I think, all hands on deck tried to contribute what we understand about communication channels, how you do research, how you bring people together, and just get it done as quickly and effectively, but with the greatest veracity of data that we can um, around the world for, for doctors, wherever they might be. Well, Dr. Green, Dr. Chung, and Dr. Irons, thanks for being with us here today and sharing your perspectives and for all the research that you're doing. Still a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, one thing we do know, uh, it's important as we try to safely reopen three things, wear a mask, uh, wash your hands and keep your physical distancing. Uh, thank you so much uh, for updated resources on COVID-19. Go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us and take care.